At this year's Cambridge Science Festival, meet the creators and the cast of Redesign, a newly commissioned dramatisation of just some of the thousands of Charles Darwin's letters. Hear him debate with the American Harvard professor Asa Gray about the great issues of science and religion, war and slavery. And also hear Darwin talk of his personal tragedies, his triumphs, family holidays and gardening. The Darwin Correspondence Projects are based at the University Library here in Cambridge and they are uh, collecting and editing and publishing all the letters that, that uh, Charles Darwin ever wrote, um, all the letters he received um, you know, over the many years um, that he was, uh, he was corresponding with people all around the world, uh, collecting data from them. He used to use people to, to pick up scientific facts here, there and everywhere. Uh, he used to try his ideas out on people. Um, but, and also uh, they were filled with, you know, these relationships lasted many decades some of them uh, and they, they, they was, um, we would share domestic details and, uh, and, and there's plenty of humour and warmth and real humanity about them, real relationships being built up and real conversations being had uh, through these letters, uh, amazing body of material. After a chance meeting with uh, one of the editors working on the project, um, we got talking and got quite excited by the idea of turning some of these letters into, uh, into a play. Um, and making them more accessible to, to, to the general public, uh, making more people aware of that. And we talked some more and we alighted on, uh, on a particular correspondence between Darwin and uh, an American botanist called Asa Gray, who was the leading uh, botanist in the States at the time. He was Professor of Natural History at Harvard University. Um, and what's interesting about Gray is that he was, uh, it turned out to be um, the, one of the, well, the staunchest defender of Darwin's ideas in the States. Um, lots of religious people particularly were very uh, hostile towards Darwin's ideas, but, but Asa Gray really uh, stood up for them, stood up for Darwin. Um, and he himself was a very devout Christian, um, but was able to accommodate um, Darwin's ideas very happily into his own, um, into his own religious beliefs. The play uses only the actual words of, of Darwin and Gray and um, other correspondence that they had with other people at the time. Um, and, and a lot of that that we use in the play is unpublished material. Organic nature abounds with unmistakable and irresistible indications of design. And being a connected and consistent system, this evidence carries the implication of design throughout the whole. I am bewildered. I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do and as I should wish to, evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to be too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the Ichnomenidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, or that a cat should play with mice. Not believing this, I see no necessity in the belief that the eye was expressly designed. On the other hand, I cannot anyhow be contented to view this wonderful universe and, and especially the nature of man and to conclude that everything is the result of brute force. Natural selection is not the wind which propels the vessel, but the rudder which by friction, now on one side, now on the other, shapes its course. Variation answers to the wind. In breeding, only from those individuals that vary most in a desirable direction, man leads the course of variation as he leads a streamlet, apparently at will, but never against the force of gravitation. I'm inclined to look at everything as resulting from designed laws, with the uh, details, whether good or bad, left to the working out of what we might call chance. Not that this notion at all satisfies me. I feel most deeply that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. <laughs> A dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton. An innocent and good man stands under a tree and is killed by a flash of lightning. 
Now, do you believe that God designedly killed that man? And many or most persons do believe this. I can't and don't. If you do believe it, do you believe that when a swallow snaps up a gnat, that God designed that that particular swallow should snap up that particular nut at that particular instant. You reject the idea of design while all the while bringing out the neatest illustrations of it. I mean, will you honestly tell me that, that the shape of my nose was uh, ordained and guided by some, some intelligent cause? As well as talking about uh, theology and about botany, uh, Darwin and Gray also corresponded about uh, politics. Uh, uh, they lived through the American Civil War that Gray was living in Massachusetts, uh, was very much caught up in. Uh, they talked about their kids, and they moaned about their health, and they gossiped about their colleagues. Um, and it was a very warm, as well as a historically important correspondence, it's a very warm, very real, very human uh, relationship that builds up. I send a photograph of myself with my beard. Do I not look reverent? <laughs> Your photograph with the venerable beard gives the look of your having suffered and perhaps from the beard of having grown older. I hope there is still much work in you. What I shall soon have to do will be to erect a tablet in Down Church, sacred to the memory, etc., and officially die, and then publish books by the late Charles Darwin. <laughs> oh. I do not in the least know whether the Times is to be trusted that there will be peace and that the Middle States will join with the South on slavery and eject the Northern States. Some of the representations of us in the English papers would be amusing if they did not now do so great harm. Oh, how detestably the special correspondent of the Times writes on the subject. The man has not a shade of feeling against slavery. My good wife wishes me to give it up, but I tell her to give up the bloody old times, as Cobbett used to call it, would be to give up meat, drink and air. From the English papers, you must picture us as being in the extreme of confusion and turmoil and chaos. But if you were here, you would open your eyes to see everything going on quietly, hopefully and comfortably as possible. We are getting on quietly with our war. Now that we're used to it, we can keep it up two years longer, as well as not, if our rebels choose not to yield. Our courage does not fail, and I think will not. My wife, in indignation, has changed the times for the daily news. I congratulate Mrs. Darwin. Which I find rather dull.